Don't buy M1 Ultra for video editing. At least, not yet. What's up guys, Smalls here with 9to5Mac, and if you're a fan of good ideas, consider subscribing to the channel for future content like this. I've got some bad news for people considering the M1 Ultra version of the Mac Studio. Apple pretty much played us, and I'm not gonna lie, at this point I'm more confused about the situation than I am disappointed, but let me explain what I mean. Last month, Apple held the March 8th event where they revealed Mac Studio alongside the Studio Display and a bunch of other new shiny products. And as Apple does with every new processor reveal, they showed us a bunch of charts and graphs trying to show us how powerful this new M1 Ultra chip is. But the problem is that they use pre-release software to flex all these performance stats for M1 Ultra. And that software, two, well, more than two weeks later at this point, is still unavailable to the public. So applications like Final Cut Pro, DaVinci Resolve, Premiere Pro still can't really take advantage of M1 Ultra. But don't just take my word for it. Let's actually take a look at a handful of performance tests that Jeff and I ran between our Mac Studios. And just so we're clear on specs, I've got the very lowest end Mac Studio with M1 Max and 32 gigs of RAM, while Jeff has a fully specced out M1 Ultra Studio with 128 gigabytes of RAM. Before we get into all the performance stuff, there is one key hardware benefit that we gotta talk about with M1 Ultra version of Mac Studio that you can't get on the base model. And that's the fact that the M1 Ultra variant comes with two extra Thunderbolt ports on the front. The M1 Max version only has the 10 gigabit Type-C ports on the front. So for anyone who actually needs an extra Thunderbolt SSD or equivalent peripheral, the M1 Ultra version is gonna be more handy for stuff like that. But I gotta say, as a video producer and editor, I've made it out just fine with the base Mac Studio, and I've never felt as though I need to have two extra Thunderbolt ports. Let's firstly take a look at Geekbench 5 to see how these two processors compare for single core and multi-core performance. And keep in mind that M1 Ultra is essentially two M1 Max chips sandwiched together. When looking at the results for single core performance, there's basically no difference given the $2,000 price difference between these two. But when looking at multi-core performance, that's where you're really gonna see the true potential of having double the cores inside of M1 Ultra. 11,000 on M1 Max versus 24,000 on M1 Ultra is a pretty huge difference. And so theoretically, for the most intensive multi-core reliant applications, there should be a pretty big difference in performance between these two machines. Now let's dive into Final Cut Pro, which is my editing platform of choice, and go over general performance from playback within the timeline to export speeds. This is gonna give us a pretty good idea for how these machines are for handling real world video editing scenarios. So I started off with an eight minute 4K HAVC video timeline with transitions and effects. I usually like to judge playback performance in Final Cut by running a completely unrendered timeline in full quality so there's no pre-existing optimization for the video inside the timeline. And for 8K HAVC video, both M1 Max and M1 Ultra handle playback like an absolute champ. Things usually slow down a bit when playing back the transitions and effects back to back, but this is more than usable playback performance for daily editing. And then when we get into the exporting speeds, that's where you'll realize that getting M1 Ultra at this point is really unnecessary for handling this kind of footage on the regular. There's less than a 20 second difference between these two devices for exporting HEVC 4K video. And given the $2,000 price gap between the two machines, the result is obviously pretty disappointing. But like I said in the beginning, we're essentially waiting on updates for all of these pro apps to be optimized for M1 Ultra, which should hopefully increase performance by a ton. Next, I want to try some 4K 60 FPS footage to get an idea of how performance will differ between M1 Max and M1 Ultra. And it's pretty much the same result here in terms of playback and exporting performance. The timeline consisted of seven minutes worth of 4K 60 clips. And of course I added transitions and effects. And in a completely unrendered timeline, I'm getting all of my frames in full playback and in full quality. And there were only moments of stutter and lag when playing back two effects back to back, but outside of that, both machines handle these clips flawlessly. And when getting to the export speeds, there's more or less no way to justify spending the extra scratch on M1 Ultra for handling this kind of footage at this point. I got slightly over five minutes on M1 Max and a little under five minutes on M1 Ultra, and that's obviously not a huge difference at all. Ever since Apple Silicon Max hit the streets, I've been waiting on a version of M1 that can handle playing back 8K HEVC footage in full quality, as that's what both Jeff and I shoot on our Canon R5 cameras. And this 8K codec is notorious for being difficult to work with on many platforms. Platform. So when M1 Ultra was announced, we were once again hoping for another shot at achieving that full quality playback because M1, M1 Pro, and M1 Max still can't handle smooth playback 
for this codec in full quality in pretty much any NLE. And that remains true for the M1 Max version of Mac Studio. Playback is definitely better than what you'll find on M1 and M1 Pro, but still very choppy to say the least. And if you're doing something within another application when trying to play back this HEVC footage, you'll likely notice that everything else within the operating system starts to bog down. And then when you add a lot of transitions and effects, it definitely gets worse. When getting the playback on M1 Ultra, the experience is slightly better, but mostly the same. And you can pretty much deem full quality unrendered playback to be pretty much unusable for daily editing if that's something you want to do. To get usable playback, you'll still have to either proxy your footage or use performance mode for playback. When getting to the actual export speeds though, you'll find that M1 Ultra is slightly faster, but once again, pretty hard to justify that massive price gap at this point. For this seven minute project, M1 Max completed the export in 10 minutes and 18 seconds, while M1 Ultra completed the export in eight minutes and 32 seconds. And while that's the biggest gap in export speeds we've seen thus far, it's still hard to justify M1 Ultra over M1 Max for that kind of stuff. 8K HEVC video is pretty tough to work with as you saw, but 8K RAW video from a Canon R5 is even harder to work with. And if you've watched any of our other Mac Studio videos up to this point, you'll know what I mean. I made an eight minute timeline of 8K RAW footage with transitions and effects, and playback performance is interesting because while it's definitely worse than 8K HEVC in terms of pure playback performance, you'll find that the rest of the OS doesn't get bogged down like it does when trying to playback 8K HEVC footage. So there's clearly a level of optimization that M1 Max and M1 Ultra has for RAW footage that it doesn't have for HEVC or H.265 video at this point. And this is more or less the case for both M1 Max and M1 Ultra. So once again, spending that extra two grand for M1 Ultra is proving to not be worth it with the current optimization levels. And when getting to the actual export speeds, there's only a six-ish minute difference between these two Macs. And I wonder what hardware element inside of M1 Ultra is giving it that slight edge over M1 Max. But either way, there's no reason you should buy M1 Ultra for 8K raw video at this point. But I do think it's fair to point out how much better playback and export performance is compared to M1 and M1 Pro. I ran these same tests on my M1 Pro MacBook Pro and M1 Mac Mini, and it took over twice as long to complete these exports. So spending the extra cash on M1 Max over M1 or M1 Pro is definitely worth it in my eyes for handling 8K video particularly. I want to wrap this testing up by working with some red raw footage from a red camera. So this is video footage from cameras that some of your favorite tech YouTubers use like MKBHD and Dave2D. And so I firstly made an eight minute timeline with effects and transitions of 6K R3D footage. Also half of the clips in here are software stabilized just so you know. And I was honestly very impressed with overall playback performance on both of these machines. You're not necessarily getting full frame playback here, but given all the effects and transitions and the stabilization, it's very usable for editing stuff like this on the regular. When getting to the actual export speed, there's barely a one minute difference between M1 Max and M1 Ultra. M1 Max did the export in a little over 14 minutes while M1 Ultra did the export in a little over 13 minutes. So just like all the other tests, you can't really justify M1 Ultra for for red raw video editing as of yet. But I do have to point out that for whatever reason, my M1 MacBook Pro with M1 Pro completed the same export in nearly half the time of both variants of Mac Studio, including the $8,000 variant that Jeff has. Why? I have absolutely no clue. We're still really trying to figure that out, but this is definitely something that needs to be addressed by Red or Apple or both. I also created an 8K R3D video project with effects and transitions, of course, and we're dealing with the same sentiment here. Playback between both M1 Max and M1 Ultra are very comparable, uh, but you're not going to be getting full frame playback, especially with the added effects and transitions. But in full quality and unrendered, the playback performance is definitely usable for everyday editing, but not as smooth as the 6K footage. And when getting to the actual export speeds, we've once again got like a two minute difference in speed with the M1 Max version completing the export in 41 minutes while M1 Ultra completed the export in 43 minutes. And given the resolution, that isn't an unreasonable export time, but once again, not only did my M1 Pro MacBook Pro complete the export in a much faster 26 minutes, but my M1 Mini even completed the export in 23 minutes, which is jarring 
to say the least. And hopefully there's an update to Final Cut or Red's Final Cut plugin that fixes this issue. Because if we're using M1 and M1 Pro speeds to judge performance for M1 Max and M1 Ultra as far as how it should be, we should be getting way faster exports for these processors. So with all of these tests complete, I think it's apparent here that there are a few major issues that need to be addressed with M1 Ultra and M1 Max. The fact that you're paying eight grand to get a one or two minute faster export for video editing and nearly identical playback performance is a big issue. And then the fact that my $900 Mac Mini and M1 MacBook Pro whooped Mac Studio for handling R3D footage is also very strange. And while Apple doesn't necessarily have any control over optimizing that kind of footage for Mac, it's still unacceptable if you ask me. So whenever we do get the app updates that support M1 Ultra and everything it's capable of, we'll probably have to run this video back and do these tests all over again because I'm only assuming that we're waiting for the proper optimization to make M1 Ultra a much more justifiable purchase. And I do wonder, like when we get these inevitable updates for M1 Ultra and presumably M1 Max, if it's gonna justify the price hike that these devices command because Apple's tend to disappoint us with these charts and performance graphs in the past. So I'm really curious if this update we're waiting on is gonna really change the game the way Apple claims M1 Ultra is. But all in all, please do not buy an M1 Ultra version of the Mac Studio for video editing, at least not now. I gotta say, if you have to have a Mac Studio now, the base model, the very lowest end base model, I guess you could probably add you know, some more storage if you'd like, but the lowest end processor version of Mac Studio is definitely the one to get. And if you wanna check out where you can purchase the base Mac Studio, I'll have some links in the description below. But that's gonna be about it for this video. Uh, for my M1 Ultra users, how's the experience been for tasks like video editing and what device are you coming from? Let us know in the comments down below and be sure to give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed and hit that subscribe button for future content like this. Thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys in the next one.